I think we can start. Mm. Hello, thank you. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, we are recording this um, so that it will, can be used both by uh, the students that, cannot, that couldn't be here today and by the Cisco, uh, by the Cisco um, be published on the Cisco website because Cisco is uh, the Society of uh, Italian Contemporary Historians, is what is the main promoter of this, of this event. This is the fourth episode, the first, uh, the fourth uh, meeting we have in different universities. Uh, we had a meeting in Salerno, we had two meetings in Modena, and this one in Padova is organized by the Mobilab, that is our um, digital laboratory inside the Mobility and Humanities Excellence Project. Uh, and um, and um, this series of events of uh, uh, meetings that started at um, more or less uh, one year ago, uh, as his last, uh, uh, his last event today. But we do hope, we uh, deeply hope that uh, it can be something that we can do next year too. Maybe by using the uh, ideas and matters and discussion and questions that will emerge today to organize a new, uh, new events, a new series of events. Uh, today, we will talk about web archiving. And while many of you can uh, probably intuitively understand what this means, it's actually a very complex topic and a topic that has, has not had in Italy a, uh, well, a deep discussion, let's say. Uh, let's start from something that everybody here can agree on, meaning that today's and yesterday's web will be crucial for the historical reconstruction of the future. Future historians will need web sources. This is a fact. Nobody, I think, can uh, discuss that, and it's not even uh, probably necessary to, to explain why since our most, of, most of our life is on the web or as a mirror on the web, the web will be an important historical resource. And it's not only a future problem, a future matter. The web and so-called born digital sources are already used in historical research as some of the speakers here today can attest. And and also saving what has been said online as wider and deeper implication that goes beyond historical reconstruction or humanistic research, especially in the ephemeral environment that is the, today the web, and especially in the age of social networks, fake news, online disinformation. So it's not, it's not only an academic matter, it's a social matter, and it's a crucial matter of our time. And yet, as I was saying, the web as a source, as an historical source, is not a popular topic. And this, this is not for a lack of uh, subjects or problems that need to be discussed. In preparing this short introduction, I came up with a very bad looking slide uh, that I will show you today here. Just a second. In which I try to summarize in a very imperfect manner some of what looked to me as the main topics that needs to be discussed uh, in relation to uh, the uh, web archiving and more in general, using the web as an historical source. That is not only web archive. So main, the main problem, and I will go very fast on this because of course, we will talk about this in the class again, 
uh, later on. But, and uh, our speaker today will talk better and deeper and in a deeper way than me, but I will just give you an overview of what I look uh, of what I think when I, when I think about using the web as a source. First of all, the main problem that everybody always uh, mentioned is the sheer quantity of the sources that have to be saved. And this creates problems and, well, leads to the fact that most of the web archiving is made in, in an automated or semi-automated way through software. So a main problem in relation to previous historical research or archival practice is what's the relationship between the human element and the software element in the preservation effort. This is one big topic that changes from case to case. And that of course, it deserves a, uh, a debate. It exists a debate, but is often uh, uh, relegated to the specialist of the field. While as I was trying to express before, in the near future, all historians or contemporary historians or, mo or modern historians will have to deal with this. Another point, legislation. There are legal obstacles to the preservation of web sources, copyright in the first place, right? Um, but it's not only uh, copyright and the tools that we look for and we try to take in place, to put in place to, uh, to overcome the copyright restrictions. It's also the fact that the web is made up of private content too. Uh, mm, content that is uh, behind a paywall or simply behind a login sources that are personal sources and that mm, contrary to, for example, letters in the past will probably be lost unless a legislation and a, a academic effort to preserve them is put in place. In some parts of the world it is, of the world it is, in Italy not so much. Access, once we have preserved we have gathered these sources, the website, these historical websites. How do we offer them to researchers or to the general population? We make them free for all, like the uh, Internet Archive and Wayback Machine does. And then we have problem with copyrights and on, on, well, well, all kinds of different problems. Uh, or do we restrict the access? to people that goes to a library or goes to a single archive that has some uh, particular rights of reproduction of some particular material. What kind of contextualization it is needed to, uh, to uh, allow historical research, metadata. Uh, we go back to the, to the uh, software role in uh, web archiving. What kind of, of metadata can be put on such a huge uh, corpus of data. Who does that? The archivist, the human element, or the software element, or both? And then research. How uh, to show to the researcher or to the general population the historical web, a website that was present and maybe 10 years ago and now it's uh, it disappeared from the live web as the specialists know the uh, the uh, all saved the web pages are collage are a uh, mesh of different elements in which different temporalities can coexist so maybe i'm looking at a page that was saved and what i'm looking at is the text from one date and the image from another date so it's a new, in this case, really new. All the other matters can be uh, linked to, the, to, the, uh, to other problems that historians have faced in the past. But in this case, we are looking at a preservation that in the same page, in the same source, has different temporalities. Meaning that it's possible that the preserved web page that we are looking at never existed in the past as we are looking at uh, in, in the moment in which try, we try to reconstruct the past. And this leads to another question, how to study it? Which tools can be used to study these kind of resources? 
last and not least, but not least, uh, the new possibilities that both web sources and uh, and uh, uh, born digital sources allow to historians. For example, the possibility to preserve historical events while they are happening. So, uh, for example, creating a, a digital archive. Uh, a web archive of the 2019-2020 pandemic. And how do we involve historical actors, meaning actors, social actors, people, uh, people that are not professional historians, uh, in the creation of this archive? Which are the tools that allow uh, the crowd, so-called, to uh, participate in this kind of huge and always incomplete effort. So all this means that the meager three hours that we have today will not even begin to scratch the surface. Uh, and they are meant to be the beginning of a conversation. I really hope that the Mobilab here in, in our department and Cisco on a national level will be uh, engaging in this, uh, in this effort, engaging in these debates in the near future. And possibly that this small gathering we have today could be the beginning of practical initiatives in this field in Italy. And I remember to you that unless I am mistaken, Italy is one of the few Western uh, countries that do not have in place a project of uh, preservation of the top level domain, the dot .it, the punto .it domain. Uh, although there, are, there is a decree from the president of, the, of our Republic uh, in order to put it in place, already was made in uh, 2010, uh, it, it did not have a following, as far as I know. So that, that means that we are behind, but it also means that there is a, a, a open field in front of us to experiment, to uh, start with maybe little, small uh, projects, I, hope, I really hope that this could be a, uh, a um, beginning in this direction. And this conversation today we start, will be started by uh, Samir Musa, is record manager at the European University Institute, and he is an archivist specialized in the treatment of digital archives. Uh, in, at the uh, EUE, EUI, sorry, is in charge of receiving, arranging, describing, and indexing the web uh, on, and publishing on the web uh, the uh, European Institutional Archive. So he's uh, an expert on web archiving too. Uh, Samir will talk to us about uh, web archiving and web preservation, what will be left of our digital heritage. Samir, let me just... Open your file. Thank you. And share it. Hello, hello everybody. Thank you very much for this opportunity to participate at this interesting meeting. And as uh, Federico already said, I'm, uh, I'm Samir Musa and I'm working at the European University Institute, um, uh, in particular at the historical archives uh, of the European Union. So um, 
I'm the digital archivist, so I would like just uh, to uh, start my presentation with a very brief uh, um, framework about the historical archives of, of the European Union for whom uh, does not yet, uh, know yet uh, this uh, uh, institution. Um, the historical archives of the European Union uh, is a, an international organization um, uh, which aims at collecting, preserving and making accessible uh, the digital uh, not only the digital, the paper-based archives, but also the uh, born digital and digitized uh, archives uh, produced by the European institutions. Not only the Euro by um, European institutions, but also um, private uh, organizations and person, persons and personalities um, uh, who um, contributed deeply uh, to the European Union integration process. Um, the mission of the historical archives is to encourage uh, the research. Uh, of the, on the history of uh, uh, European Union institution, not only through uh, the European Union uh, institutional archives, but also through uh, private archives, as I, I said. Uh, the historic archives was established in uh, 1984 uh, at the European University Institute, uh, which is a, an international organization uh, devoted to um, doctoral and postdoctoral studies on uh, um, on uh, European integration. So um, uh, the, the, this is uh, this, uh, the UI uh, was um, uh, born in uh, um, at the end of the of the 70s, uh, the historical archives uh, at the beginning of the 80s. Uh, this is a, just a boring slide about uh, statistical data and the figures of the historical archives. I would like just to stress your attention on the first line of this uh, uh, this data about the um, the number of fonts. Uh, the archival fonts are meant as a, the complex of records uh, produced by an institution as stakeholder. And as you can see, uh, we have almost 200 fonts, archival fonts, uh, to be uh, managed, uh, the, which means that uh, we need to deal with a great variety of archival fonts a great, um, and a great number of different archival uh, traditions. Um, and one of the most challenging uh, part of our daily work is to harmonize uh, the different uh, archival tradition, the different uh, um, archival uh, arranging methods or uh, description. Um, so this is the historical archives. I would like to just to show you if I can. This is a the holdings, the, just the, the overall overall uh, for, for holdings uh, um, uh, preserved by the. Okay. The yeah, screen yeah. with the zoom, see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, with okay. the people at home, you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, we, we are sharing the presentation and uh, this is the um, uh, just the um, uh, the web portal of the um, uh, online inventories uh, managed by the uh, historical archives of the european union uh, just to um, uh, let you see uh, how many um, how many fonts archival fonts we are dealing with uh, we have the in particular the um, 
funds uh, uh, concerning the European the European Parliament, uh, the Council of Ministers, uh, the European Commission, uh, Court of Auditor, etc. And for each fund, uh, we we can browse into the uh, um, online inventory and uh, in this case for example we uh, we have only the paper-based um, dossier the paper-based file uh, um, um, of these fonts uh, but in other cases we have also the digitized and the digital from uh, um, document uh, um, available to um, uh, the citizen uh so let's go again to the presentation and uh, uh about the web archives um as federico mentioned it's not is is not only a question to uh, preserve everything about what we uh, produce uh, and uh, about our web contents, uh, about our uh, websites uh, and the web pages. Um, uh, as, as everybody can, uh, can understand that the web has no boundaries and no, no limits. And uh, in this uh, Mare Magnum, it is really hard to um, uh, understand and to um, appraise uh, what we would like uh, to preserve and to uh, maintain uh, for 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 a, uh, on a long term basis. Um, so uh, what we need in um, actually is um, especially a good uh, selection and appraisal process before uh, before setting up uh, anything about web preservation and uh, web archiving. And uh, on the other side, uh, the web archives opens uh, the, the door uh, to a critical method for the future of digital research. Um, um, obviously, web archives actually has, uh, have evolved, uh, evolved considerably uh, in the last uh, um, 20 years. And uh, um, I, it is a, an historical source, um, a fundamental, a key uh, historical source for anybody uh, who, who likes to uh, um, make a comprehensive research on uh, uh, I, I would say any topics um, uh, of, of, of research. Uh, so um, this leads to um, the need to um, uh, build a me method, a coherent method for uh, research, especially for uh, web, web archives and uh, web, web archiving. Uh, what is the, it is needed is uh, um, a, a common knowledge base uh, for uh, for uh, the um, uh, to understand the um, the critical method for the uh, for the website and for the web archiving um, uh, and in this sense uh, we um, not 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 really here in Italy but in general there is a, a a great um, 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 approach uh, for the uh, web archiving and for the uh, study of the method of the uh, research on on the web archiving, and uh, this leads to a robust uh, method for uh, researching the uh, digital for for the, uh, the web archiving. Uh, another point is the accessibility and the scalability of the uh, web archiving solutions uh, for uh, to available for research and uh, in general for uh, whom interested into this uh, um, uh, matter. Um, accessibility um, it's not is not just a matter of preserving uh, the look and feel of the uh, of the web pages uh, as built in the in in, in the past uh, or at least this is just the very first step we need the tools to um uh, to um in order to um uh, make our research more effective uh, and to have a most comprehensive uh, view of, of of all the web pages uh, we um, uh, 
uh, we have uh, or, or we had in the, in the past. I would like just to mention, uh, for example, an interesting project, uh, Memento project, uh, which uh, um, which is particularly um, uh, uh, focused on on the accessibility uh, of the uh, of, of web archiving uh, um, uh, sources, and uh, um, this project, the Memento project, allows, uh, um, for example, the researcher uh, to uh, customize uh, your uh, searching uh, and to go through the, uh, for example, to go um, um, uh, through a different the different version of a web page um, uh, through the different the different crawl um, uh, the um, the tool made uh, in in the past so you you, you can have for example a, a, a different perspective of the same web page uh, and uh, as evolved uh, during the uh, years and this is a, a, a tool uh, uh, which aims at improving accessibility uh, the another point is about the uh, interdisciplinarity uh, of the um, of web archive uh, I cover research, uh, which is connected to uh, to the nature of the of the web uh, of the web source uh, itself. Uh, as you uh, as you can see, for any web contents that you are dealing with, uh, you, we have a variety of media and uh, plugin applications. Um, uh, within uh, uh, the, the same web, web page. Um, uh, it, it is not only a textual um, uh, page, but we, we have a different uh, audiovisual plugin, etc. But it, it is not only this, we, we, we have also uh, uh, the, the, um, different um, way of communication. For example, um, uh, um, the um, uh, publication office of the European Union is uh, thinking of uh, uh, preserving uh, the um, the Twitter uh, the Twitter accounts and the um, uh, the messaging accounts uh, of, of personalities or of, uh, uh, obviously of um, public uh, personalities involved with uh, um, the European Union um, organization uh, because because of the, the this also this way of communication is part of uh, of the future research of the future of the um, digital heritage uh, we need to preserve finally but um, uh, but it is important to uh, we we need also to um, um, improve uh, the reliability and validity of the of uh, our web sources uh, and this is fu fundamental uh, for uh, the um, uh, for for um, for make our research uh, uh, trustable and uh, um, uh, reliable uh, for 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 the future um, federico again uh, mentioned about the fake news about the uh, um, uh, the what we we can see the commonly um, uh, going through the um, different web pages and uh, um, and this is um, um, strictly connected to the need to uh, uh, improve the reliability of the of the web sources. Uh, the, the web sources is a, an, um, 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 is a fragile uh, web content uh, and. Uh, uh, as you, as you know, uh, a web a web page uh, lasts um, um, on average uh, um, just three three years, uh, and uh, and after this period it, it disappears, simply disappears. Um, very simply, uh, if if we need to um, build a web bibliography uh, for our research. Uh, we need to trust the, uh, the 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 list of the of the websites uh, we uh, we put in in, in our research, uh, but but this is really hard and this is really difficult. So. Um, uh, what we need for, uh, for example, for for this last point is to um, uh, to build a a, a very um, a, 
a, a well done, a, a well comprehensive um, uh, trusted digital repository uh, for uh, the long-term access of this uh, web, web resource. Um, I, I preferred uh, to mention directly the uh, trusted digital repository, not uh, only the web archiving and web preservation, because uh, in, in my opinion, but I mean, in, as a um, um, as a common um, sense uh, for for the digital preservation literature, uh, the web preservation and the web archiving is just a part of this uh, uh, trusted digital uh, um, um, repository, and it is part of the digital preservation program we need to put in place uh, in, uh, um, in generally in a, a public or private organization uh, to preserve and to manage uh, the um, web, web resources. Uh, what is a, a trusted digital repository uh, is defined as the um, a, as a, the repository uh, um, uh, whose mission is to provide a reliable uh, long-term access to manage the digital sources to customers now and, and in the future. This is the OCLC uh, definition. Um, in, in the um, diagram on the uh, right frame, uh, you, you can see that uh, uh, the, uh, it is not just a, a matter of, of a software uh, to, to be used for uh, preserving the, um, uh, the web contents or in general the digital or digitized, digitized contents for, for, for the future. But we need to, uh, uh, to, um, to use different tools and to use um, above all a, a, a policy, uh, a policy strategy uh, for, uh, for maintaining uh, the, 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 uh, the digital archives and uh, above all to uh, let these digital archives accessible in, in the future. Um, about the web archiving uh, service, uh, in particular, um, uh, I put this uh, general um, a general slide um, in order to make you understand that the web archiving service includes different uh, steps and different stages for uh, the um, uh, for um, making the um, web contents available uh, and accessible for the uh, final users. Um, uh, as you can see, the uh, web archiving service, uh, um, I, I would say that this is uh, the, um, it, it is commonly, it is a, a common schema used by the different uh, projects uh, whom, which use uh, the, which uh, promotes the uh, web archiving service. And uh, it, it comprises the, the uh, selection, the crawling, harvest, quality control, access, and uh, uh, eventually the long-term uh, preservation of the, um, of the web content. Uh, as you can see uh, in, in this um, process, the preservation itself is just the very last step. Uh, first of all, uh, as, as I said before, uh, what we need is the appraisal. Uh, the uh, selection of the digital material uh, to be preserved uh, for um, for the um, uh, for the future. Um, uh, in particular, but uh, yeah, I'll um, I'll um, show you um, fine in. Um, at the uh, at the end of my uh, presentation, I'm focusing on uh, the uh, publication office uh, uh, of the European Union project about the uh, web archiving uh, service. Uh, the um, um, publication office um, focused on uh, the uh, on preserving the uh, .eu. Um, uh, websites and in particular the websites produced by the uh, European institutions. Um, so selection. Uh, 
as I, as I, as I uh, showed you before, the selection is the first step uh, on in uh, uh, in uh, the web archiving process, and um, it, it comprises uh, policy and the methodology, uh, which are both needed uh, for any web archiving program. Um, we we can identify um, uh, three. Uh, selection methods, uh, not selective, thematic, and hybrid, and uh, which are based on uh, uh, essentially on, on, on this criteria: uh, regularity. Uh, some some institution uh, keep uh, their web contents for any an indefinite period uh, or at least a very long uh, period because they, their mission is to publish the content but other institution or other organization uh, uh, just uh, create a web content or uh, only on a, a, an event-based management so in this sense uh, the capture the uh, the uh, uh, must be uh, done uh, as soon as possible. Uh, for example, in, in the in the, in this last case. Um, on the other side, uh, the uh, we um, uh, we we need to focus only um, uh, um, uh, also on uh, uh, the content of dynamism of the um, of the web page. Um, for instance, uh, we uh, a, a news uh, a newspaper is uh, uh, pretty different to um, 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 uh, with a, um, an institutional uh, web website. The newspaper has a, a very dynamic um, content uh, changes um, on a, uh, um, on a, at least on a daily basis, but um, on um, but uh, uh, often uh, on um, uh, in the, on the same job we can have a different uh, uh, version of the same uh, web content. Uh, on the other side, the institutional website is more static. Um, um, again, uh, monitoring uh, websites is fundamental, especially with um, risky uh, web pages, which can be uh, deleted. Um, um, we, um, for example, we we have a. A great number of um, of projects uh, which uh, um, get uh, um, um, funding uh, for, um, for for a period, and then uh, when the funding uh, ends, uh, the, 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 simply the the web contents uh, disappear. Uh, so uh, again, uh, the um, uh, the monitoring of, the, of, of this web website is fundamental um, in order to capture and to uh, crawl uh, effectively uh, the, the these contents. Uh, the, the publication office, office uh, um, um, used uh, is using a um, I would say a hybrid approach for uh, the selection process. Uh, they are um, systematically um, crawling uh, um, the um, the websites produced by the European institutions at least uh, four times per year. Uh, so for for let's say for uh, for snapshots of these uh, um, web websites, but uh, um, for example. Um, for example, with the pandemic, uh, they um, uh, they made a an extraordinary um, a snapshot uh, um, for the uh, websites uh, um, dedicated to the um, uh, COVID portal, so to the European COVID uh, portal. And uh, for example, for the uh, European Parliament election, uh, they um, uh, uh, they snapshot the uh, the um the, the, the website uh, for for this particular uh, particular event so um, i would say it, it is a an hybrid approach 
um, crawling and harvesting. Uh, we um, I I mentioned before the term uh, crawling. Uh, the crawler is a piece of software uh, which uh, um, visits the uh, websites and uh, reads uh, the pages and other information and uh, capture the uh, the web content. Uh, the um, uh, the web crawler, the crawler used by the um, publication office uh, are Heritrix and uh, Browser, uh, which are the I would say the most common uh, crawler uh, actually available. Uh, the um, um, what is uh, uh, crawled in uh, uh, by the um, by this uh, software is the uh, seed uh, seed URL, um, which is the both the starting point for the crawler and uh, the access uh, point. Uh, the seed is something like the um, the, the root of the of the uh, of the web page of the URL and all the directories and all the web pages contained uh, by this uh, um, by this uh, root by this uh, um, uh, web page. Uh, so um, uh, saying that we uh, we are crawling a seed URL uh, uh, that that means that we we can. Uh, crawl an entire website, a specific part of this website, so the directory of the of this uh, website, uh, and also the specific document um, uh, identified by a specific URL. Uh, um, uh, again, um, uh, contained with, within uh, this uh, seed URL. Um, as I said, um, the, typically uh, the um, crawling uh, process uh, take, uh, um, takes uh, one to three weeks uh, to, um, uh, to crawl all the web content. It depends obviously on the size of the, of, of the websites. The, uh, the Commission and the European Parliament websites are very large. Uh, they have uh, multiple uh, languages, so we have a, a, a different version of the same website in the all uh, European Union languages. Uh, languages, so it it is uh, particularly uh, complex. Um, um, the, during the crawl, the, the, the site and page must be permanently accessible and. Uh, um, uh, very often uh, a website requires more than one crawl to compl complete the um, archive as I, say, as, I, as I mentioned for example for the European Parliament or the Commission. Uh, uh, as I said before, the um, uh, the, the crawling process uh, um, uh, occur, uh, occur uh, um, four times per year, uh, and uh, but the also exceptional archives are created uh, on uh, um, also on a website owners' uh, request. I uh, forgot before to mention this case. Uh, we, uh, for example, the the owners um, um, submit. Uh, the request to um, uh, to get a um, a website uh, um, capture, uh, for example, because uh, he um, he or she knows that uh, in in the next future uh, the web page will uh, uh, disappear uh, because the project uh, ends or because of for any for, for any reason, and so the uh, in this case the the publication office accepts this um, uh, the owners are request. Um, or, uh, for example, another, another case is when, when uh, a web page um, uh, uh, is going to be modified uh, very, very deeply in, in the next future. Um, for example, we have a, a 
a legal change uh, of, of the of, of the institution and so um, uh, we need to capture the before and after um, uh, websites uh, for 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 the future research quality control uh, quality control is the, um, I, I think that is, that could be uh, considered um, a um, a particular um a, or no, I, I wouldn't say an innovative but a, a, a challenging point for the uh, uh, for the uh, publication office uh, uh, web archiving project uh, um, and uh, i think uh, um, it, it is a succeeding now uh, because uh, we um, they they have involved uh, the um, the website owner uh, themselves uh, in this process, uh, pro process uh, the, uh, um, uh, for the quality control, um, uh, um, in order to check uh, whether a capture has been successful and if it is necessary to repeat uh, the crawl, a, a key element is the agreement with the uh, website's uh, owner. Um, uh, for, for this, uh, the publication office encourages uh, the website owners uh, to uh, check uh, the um, the crawl and uh, to uh, inform the um, the team to, um, about uh, any anomaly about uh, if if the uh, the web content has not been downloaded correctly or um, if a, a link uh, does not work properly uh, and um, in this sense, um, I, I repeat the participation of the website uh, um, of the website owners is uh, um, a key element. Sorry, when you say website owner, yeah, you mean a single part of the European Union, or it can be a private owner? Can it be? No, I mean, uh, it could be a, a private owner, but in, in our case, it's, it's, it's just the, the institution itself. Uh, I mean, uh, um, uh, for any uh, European institution, that uh, we uh, we have identified a responsible for the for the uh, for the this uh, web archiving project, uh, and uh, um, uh, who uh, he or she is uh, responsible for uh, analyzing and for controlling the uh, the the captures and the uh, the calls um, in 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 our case it, they are all public institutions. Um, I I I I wasn't ever really precise before the the focus of the of the OP project is on and not generally on the the dot eu websites but only on the websites produced by uh, the european institutions so uh, the dot eu websites could include also private uh, organization but uh, the um, the focus of the op um, uh, project is only on uh, european union institutions so uh, the, the, the quality control um, uh, includes uh, the um, uh, the virus and fixity control, uh, redundancy copies, uh, search indexing by URL or full text, uh, metadata, uh, IP pro, uh, address resources, MIME type, uh, etc. Uh, finally, uh, not really finally, the access. Uh, um, uh, this is another uh, another tricky point because, of, uh, as Federico mentioned before, uh, it relates uh, with the, the uh, national laws about the accessibility of the uh, of the web content uh, and in general of this uh, uh, material. Um, I uh, I would say that for the OP this is not really a problem uh, in the sense that uh, 
uh, as a, a general rule, uh, the access of web content, but in general of digital archives, is uh, um, is felt as a, a right of the European citizen. It is felt as a, as an as an open access of this uh, um, of this material. So, um, as a general rule, uh, the transparency uh, must be. Uh, 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 must be encouraged for any uh, European institutions. Obviously, uh, the problem is, for example, for the, uh, the deep web or for the internet pages, uh, which are not uh, called uh, in, uh, during the, uh, the harvesting process that I, I mentioned before. Uh, in the, in the for the uh, I would say for for these internet pages uh, where uh, sometimes we have also complex uh, digital archives uh, in, uh, for for for, the, for these uh, um, digital files um, we um, they apply uh, the archival rules uh, um, set by the European Commission. The archival rules uh, uh, by the European Commission um, um, oblige uh, the um, European institution to deposit uh, their, the, their um, paper-based archive and the digitized copy for um, consultation purposes uh, to Florence and to uh, the historical archives after a 30 years period. Um, we, the, the result, there is a, a the, this uh, Intermediary, intermediary period, um, uh, um, uh, which is the, called the intermediary uh, archives, uh, where um, for for consultation uh, we we need to um, submit a specific request uh, to the uh, European uh, to the European institution. But um, I'm I'm talking only about the um, uh, the digital contents uh, we, which are not. Uh, um, included uh, into the uh, uh, general web pages. The general web pages are totally accessible and are totally open to uh, the uh, to the citizen. So uh, the archived the archived content uh, are available available uh, generally uh, twenty four hours after the uh, crawl. Eventually, the long-term preservation stage, uh, um, probably it, it, is the, it is the most complex and the uh, most tricky uh, part of the, of the entire uh, process. Uh, the OP um, uh, is dedicating a specific uh, working group, uh, uh, a specific committee on the long-term preservation, uh, preservation of the website contents, uh, uh, which comprises uh, uh, all, all institutions, all the institutions. And uh, I, um, I, 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 as we, we are uh, seeing it, 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 it is a really complex and it is a really, really hard to uh, preserve this content for a very on, on a very long term uh, basis. As I said before, the uh, trusted digital uh, preservation system is the key, is the most important part for this uh, um, for the, for this stage, and uh, it, it is not not only meant for uh, the um, for the web pages for the web contents, but it, uh, it is used also for the uh, entire digital collection produced by uh, the um, European institutions. Um, the um, metadata for preservation must include uh, the description, uh, the semantics and syntax, and the context of the uh, digital contents. Uh, um, I, I would need a, a, an entire presentation just to uh, um, uh, to explain uh, the um, uh, the digital preservation about the uh, websites. What is, it is important now is to understand that uh, a web context is 
always a, um, a, a complex ensemble of data and metadata and multimedia. So uh, um, it is not just a matter of taking snapshot of this web website, but it is also a matter of uh, context metadata, uh, reconstructing the relationships uh, between the different, uh, the different level, uh, the different directories, uh, which um, uh, um, uh, which included the, the, the website and, uh, um, the, uh, and the description itself. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, just uh, very, very last point, uh, the uh, format of, of the uh, actually used for the long-term preservation and it, it is the most standardized and uh, recent uh, standard for the web uh, web archiving uh, and the web preservation is the, the work the, uh, that is an ISO format uh, uh, which is a, a revision on the ARC file before. Um, uh, very last, um, um, I, I would um, invite everybody to, um, uh, to take a look at the last uh, uh, slide of this presentation where I put the, um, a brief description of the uh, OP um, web archiving project and the link to the digital collection uh, of the um, uh, of the um, OP uh, project uh, where you can um, amuse yourself uh, by browsing the, uh, the, the this um, um, web archiving uh, project and uh, you can take a look at the uh, different version of the uh, European Union uh, institutions of websites. Thank you very much for your attention uh, and again thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. So we will uh, devote the last hour to questions and debate. Uh, we will uh, now go directly on with uh, uh, Federico Nanni. Federico Nanni is a senior, I'm sorry, um, is a senior uh, researcher, um, data scientist in the Alan Turing Institute in London. He works on natural language processing in uh, uh, humanistic projects uh, and in social sciences. He had a PhD in history of technology and digital history at the University of Bologna. Uh, and he worked on the impact of web archives in historical research. Uh, and, oh, and he also has been a postdoc on data and web science of, in the data and web science group. I'm sorry at the University of Manhattan. Uh, so, whereas Samir gave us a look into the technicalities of uh, how to create and the problems of creating a web archive, uh, Federico will give us a, uh, uh, an insight on how it looks like for an historian to work with a web archive. Thank you, Federico. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Oh. Thank you all. I mean, it's the first time that I'm giving a presentation in front of people in like three years. So like, you know, I'm pretty excited for that. Yeah. Um, all right, yeah, thanks for the introduction. And uh, um, I'll start by giving you a little bit of an introduction, an overview of the place where I'm working with and the role that I have there, because it's not a traditional academic position. And then from there, I'll move to my background and then I'll, a little bit of an overview of the topic that I like to discuss, which is related to the challenges of collecting sources from web archives. And some of the things that I'll mention are highly related to the presentation before. So you'll see some connections here and there. Um, all right, let's start. And yes, uh, for people at home, if something is not clear, just put a question in the chat and then there will be a way of finding out if there's a question or something. All right, we'll figure out something basically. All right, so I'm working at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK National Center for Data Science and AI. It's a big research center with around 300 people placed inside the British Library, so in central London. We've been working to get, like, together all remotely for the last 
two years, more or less. So I've been there only for three months in presence at the beginning, and then like one year and a half on Zoom, and then I went back finally now uh, in presence from time to time. And I'm working as part of the research engineering group, which is a core team of researchers that are based with permanent positions at the Turing. And we work together with academics from all different disciplines, from biology to health science, to physics, to, to history. And we collaborate together on research projects. We define projects together. We, we plan them in advance and we collaborate on adopting computational methods uh, in, in research projects. We focus a lot on research reproducibility. So how to make sure that the things that you are finding when you use a computational method are consistent over time and in best practices in writing softwares and all the ethical things related to the use of data science method across different disciplines. And I'm one of the two people focusing on the adoption of computational method in, in, in the humanities and in social sciences, and especially in history, because we have a big project focused on the 19th century, um, it, basically on the 19th century in the UK from like perspective of using computational method and large scale uh, sources. Um, most of the people there in my group are, have a background in, in physics, like 90% of the people have a background in physics or mathematics or computer science. And I'm the only one there with a you know, traditional background in, in history. I did Italian literature in, in Bologna and then contemporary history. And then I started a PhD in Bologna in, in history of technology, focus on the challenges of using web archives when you, you want to study uh, the past. And this will mostly be the topic of my talk today. And most of my slides are up until 2017 because it was the last time that I spoke about my PhD. And then I moved to like a completely different position because I went. So I was already based in Germany, but then I, I started doing a postdoc in Mannheim on, on natural language processing in a computer science group. And it was the only historian among like you know, 20 computer scientists. And then I moved to, to the Turing, now working with historians most of my time, but as the computer scientist in the room, which is a bit strange. So all this overview is because like I've moved a lot across different disciplines. So it might be that I will be using like very specific language from certain disciplines or certain fields. So if something is not clear, just like say something and I'll try to be, try to explain it or yeah, put something in the chat. I don't know where the chat is at the moment, but we'll figure out something. Um, okay, so let's start. Um, so the focus of my PhD was all around the, the transition between analog and more digital materials when you're studying the past and what that will change in the way that we do and we study history, okay? So we are all familiar with, uh, you know, traditional analog sources because we, we are trained to, to deal with traditional sources, like we, with letters, with newspaper articles, with personal diaries, or in the case of history of science and technology with, for example, scientific publications. Okay, so we, we grew up as historians and we have all these examples in books and like examples that professors are making, uh, making in class referring to traditional sources. And then all these references are like going to the archive and the experience of going for the first time in an archive and finding things and, and you know, all, all interesting stuff around that. But we also know that in the last 20, 30 years, there has been a transition from you know, writing letter to writing emails. Like all the emails that we are sending all the time are like digital objects, are things that exist only on, on our laptops or on some server somewhere, but we don't print email most of the time, like also you know, for the environment. Um, newspapers, we mostly read digital newspapers. Uh, if you think about all the threads about the war in Ukraine, these are digital objects that sit on, on the Guardian or on the New York Times and we read them and they are updated every minute. But these things only exist uh, in, in a digital form. And same thing with social media. All our experience going through the pandemic, all the WhatsApp messages that we send to our parents and our families, all these shared experience and memories are digital things. They, they are there, we know how to find them from time to time. We go through our photos and then suddenly there are all these photos of making bread during the pandemic and all that stuff. These things are like things that most of the time don't exist as analog object that we print and we save and things like that. 
and scientific publications as well. Um, when I submitted my thesis in 2017, what the University of Bologna wanted from me was only a PDF. They, they got a PDF, they stored it, and they were very happy. And I was like, with all these art printed copies, I was like, okay, what do I do? I give one to my mom and like, you know, it's, so it's, you know, there's a, a shift in the production of, uh, of sources and in the collection of sources. And if we look at the way that uh, we do history methodologically, this uh, transition has an impact on the way, especially on the way that we identify sources. We, we, the way that sources for us are, you know, preserved, collected, retrieved, selected, discussed, and all these things. So given this transition, uh, my point was that we should start discussing the way that we are trained as historians, because we will face this challenge like, we are already facing this challenge. When, when you start studying the 90s, for example, the web was already available in the 90s. And when you study a topic that is relevant for your research in the 90s, you need to use web sources. Those are like, those are sitting already there. Um, and there are two challenges that usually emerge. One is the very famous one, the, the abundance of sources, okay? We are creating sources all the time and they are like, you know, every time we do a Google search, that's a, you know, a digital trace that we leave. And I don't know if you've ever used the um, Google Trends thing, where you see like, oh, what are the things that people are searching? Those things are traces that we are like, you know, live, like producing every time we do a Google search. And then Google stores that and give it back to you as a trend. So those are like, you know, those are sources. If you want to go back and identify what people were actually Googling in the first days of the pandemic, what was the most pressing thing? You will use that as a source and that's created because we were like Googling things all the time uh, or writing tweets or posting th things on, I don't know if people use Facebook anymore. Apparently I added there because it was 2017, but yeah, you know, or Instagram, maybe you put photos on Instagram. Uh, so what, this is one challenge, but the other challenge is, is how fragile these sources are. Like, you know, we always face things like a URL that is not found. Like, you know, you have a link and then that link is not there anymore and you have no idea how to find it back. There's a YouTube video and then you clicked on the link and then there's, the YouTube video is gone. Or it happened to me with, with MySpace. I had a band in, in early 2000 with my friends and, and that website is gone. Like uh, MySpace crashed and they lost almost everything there. So, you know, luckily it wasn't that great, but, but at the same time, you know, kind of memories and stuff. Um, and these things happen for like, you know, institutions as well. I had an example back then uh, for the website of the Obama administration, which completely disappeared because when there was a new administration in place, they removed all the pages. And it's not just a political thing that Trump did just for making a statement because with the Biden administration, it happened the same. They deleted everything that was there and there's a new administration now with a new website and everything. So as you can see, like from, an historical point of view is a challenge. Like things are disappearing all the time. And we are also creating a lot of new sources all the time at the same time. And so the research question in my thesis was, it's a methodological research question. Like which methodology should we combine with the way that we are trained as historians in order to face these challenges? Like we, you know, we finish our, our master's degree and we are going to you know, do a research in like doing a PhD or things like that. Okay, what are the things that we should actually know, like, you know, methodologically speaking for facing these challenges? Otherwise, we end up there completely unprepared. And the, the, you know, the way that we will reconstruct the past will be, will be only partial. Every representation of the past is partial, but, you know, we will start with, with, a, uh, with a methodological gap there. So, okay. It sounds fine when I'm presenting in a seminar in front of people that are here for hearing about web archive. But yeah, back in Bologna, I was based in a center for the history of universities and science. I was the only one interested in web archives. And then all other people in the room were interested in history of science and technology. And so I had to convince them over and over that what I was trying to do was relevant. I mean, they, they, were, on, they were on board more or less depending on the moment. So the pitch that I was trying to make there is, well, the, the center that we were part of was created in 1991, a couple of years after the ninth century of the University of Bologna, okay? 
and as a consequence of that. Okay, let's put together a center that focuses on the history of universities. And then it was like, okay, that's fantastic. But around the 90s, we also saw the, the advent of the web. So in 2088, when we will have the millenary of the University of Bologna, what sources we will use to understand this phase? Like how can, what people will use in the future to understand the history of the university? And is the website or the things that we are doing online or the content that the university is producing part of the story that we want to tell? And that, that pitch was working from time to time. I mean, I got a PhD at the end, so it was fine. Um, and one of the sources was the website. And the point that they wanted to make was, well, the website is an online presence. During the pandemic, it was the main thing that we were seeing from the, from the university. You were going to the website to figure out what was going on and whether you had an exam or not. Um, and what happened to, you know, to that specific course that you wanted to follow. Um, so, okay, the University of Bologna website has a very interesting story. One thing is that it has been created independently by different departments during the 90s, and everyone was moving independently, putting everything that they wanted online. And then in 2001, the university said, okay, let's reorganize everything. We delete everything that we produce in the first eight, nine years, because it's like, it's a mess. And we just create the Sistema Portale, a new website, all like, you know, very well branded and clear and identical all around. And then if you want, you can put back your content if you think it's very relevant. So in 2001, basically there's a huge transition and we lost most of the content that was there before. Um, so as you can see, it's a challenge for historians. If you think that this material is interesting because you want to understand how the digital and the web has changed the way that, you know, the university as an institute, related with students or with professor or with academics, well, you lost a, you lost a source over there. Um, and then as you can see, it's highly connected to the presentation before because it connected with the idea of archiving the web, this idea of preserving like, you know, layer after layer of snapshot after snapshot of a website so that you can more or less get an understanding of what was the role of that website in the past even if it's a collage of different pieces, at least you can, you can see more or less how it looked, okay? And what people were writing on the website or what they weren't writing and what were information that were excluded from the website. Uh, okay, archiving the web. It's a tricky topic when you speak about this in Italy because like a few people aware of the topic are also aware that at least back in 2017, Italy was one of the fewer countries in West Europe that were, they weren't archiving the web at all. It was like people were aware of the importance of archiving the web and they were like effort all around, uh, starting from Australia and the US and the UK. There are lots of projects in Germany about archiving the web. In Portugal, there's a fantastic project in Denmark. And I, I don't know, through the entirety of my PhD, I was sitting in seminar like this one discussing, oh, well, well, yes, and in Italy, there are little efforts here and there. There are no funds, no big projects. There was one effort on archiving PhD theses, like digital objects as PhD theses that are floating online in the Italian web sphere. We should collect them and archive all of them. And well, I don't know how representative they are of what is the Italian web sphere. Maybe not that much. Well, they are important to archive them, okay. But I mean, maybe we can argue what's the most important thing about the Italian web sphere. Um, and then in the same, at the same time, we were like losing the Italian web over and over. There were like lots of blog posts that were, and blogs that were very relevant in the early stages of the Italian web sphere that got, you know, they just disappeared. People weren't updating them anymore. Platforms like MySpace were disappearing. So it was a challenge. Luckily, there is the Internet Archive. It's a gigantic effort uh, based in San Francisco, started in 1996 with the idea of preserving the entirety of the web. Okay? They are trying to capture everything that is available online, having lots of issues with copyright and things like that. But you know, it's there, there's a tool called the Wayback Machine. Maybe you've seen it. It's, it's kind of a funny tool. So you can see like the web in the past. You just put a URL there and then you see how the web looked in, I don't know, in that website in 2005. And so for me it was, okay, that's great. Okay, we don't have an Italian web archive. The University of Bologna has changed. So we just go there, we put the URL of the website and I finally get back 
all these snapshots and it's done. Well, um, but the University of Bologna website was excluded from the Wayback Machine um, because of a problem that I'll discuss later. And so basically you don't have a national web archive, you don't have your website archive in the internet archive. So I was at that point at the beginning of my PhD, which was uh, either I changed my topic and I give it up with this idea because it's a mess, or I just like, you know, decide to try to see if I can define a new methodology in order to recreate the history of this website and recreate the past of this website without using all these things that should be available and we don't have them. So, well, I put together the few things that I learned in history. And then uh, I started from trying to see if like, you know, traditional sources could actually be useful here because we have all this distinction between, oh, the digital is digital and the traditional uh, and the analog is analog and they don't speak about each other. Well, actually it's not true. If you go to university archives, you will find out who was the team that over the years managed the website. And then you can reach out to these people and you can go to those archives and understand who was like investing on the uh, change of the website. What were the important things? For example, they spent a lot of money at the end of the nineties to create a system for paying taxes, like paying the, the registration of the new year on the website. It was a gigantic project because it was like, you know, late nineties. So it was a complex thing to handle online or registering to exams that, that, that it's like, it's interesting to read like all the ideas that they had about the backend and how to organize things so that students could see how to register to exam. And then professor, professor were doing things independently and just putting like a piece of paper and you had to write your name on, in front of the door. So, yeah. And then newspaper archives, apparently newspapers speak, uh, were speaking a lot about the website of the University of Bologna and other websites of universities in the early 90s. There are lots of articles, like, you know, these funny articles that you find in the technology section about, oh, people are trying to set up this thing, or now you have an email for your university. But then through reading this article, you get an understanding of what was the role, what were the challenges, what were things that were important to explain. And then you have like, you know, forum, blogs, using a discussion group from students discussing where to find things on the website. Like, how do I find the overview of this exam? And then people explain, oh, it's not in this part. You need to click on that part and then you need to jump to that link. Well, through all these things, I also found out this interesting blog post where apparently um, during a student protest, people hacked the website in 2007 and recreated a completely identical version of the website under another URL, adding a little bit of information about the protest, but then the website was identical. They made a gigantic copy of it. Well, this website got archived by the Internet Archive, and so it's there. They were com uh, complaining about issues with, with the university in the homepage, but then the entirety all the rest of the website has been archived, so we have a complete snapshot of it in 2007. Uh, so it's, you know, interesting thing of the challenges of web archiving and, you know, the use and the role of the website in the community. And then um, Samir before was discussing about, you know, how to specifically archive a certain domain. Um, what I found out when I, I did a visiting in, in Orus in Denmark, and we found out that from time to time, national archives make mistakes. And by mistake, they also archive things that are not related to the Danish web sphere, for example. And then if you have a link that from a Danish website goes to an Italian website, maybe the, the crawler just jumps there and also archives that website or part of it just, you know, just for the safety, because you don't know exactly what are the boundaries of your web archive because it's very hard to define what is the Danish web sphere. Is it everything that ends with DK or are also things that are under a different domain that might be relevant? So by mistake, they also archived a couple of times the University of Bologna uh, website and the Portuguese web archive did the same. They followed the link and they archived like a little piece of it, like a few links. So you get like some snapshot in 2006 and 2007 a couple of pages sitting there in the Danish web archive. And then basically I conducted lots of oral interviews with people involved in the creation of the, the new project of the Portale and people involved in the creation of department subdomains in the 90s 
they are all still very annoyed about the fact that the university changed and they may delete everything that they create. And, was, and they were like, oh, it was so useful, so well started. We did it internally and the Department of Philosophy created this beautiful website and then the university deleted it. And so you have all this tension between, you know, the idea of centralization and branding of the, uh, of the website compared to what people were actually using it. The Department of Physics used the website in the early 90s to share preprint of publications. They were putting papers, like scientific papers, on their web page in like 1992. It's like, it's very fascinating. You see all these like, like people playing around and trying to figure out what, what, why they needed a website. And yeah, and then other sources highly related to the role that internet in Bologna had in the 90s, especially we had this civic network in Bologna called Hyperbole, which was created in the very early 90s, together with the University of Bologna. And the, the projects were going together uh, end in end. And so you, you start discovering all these different connections. And then through all this, I also found out through an interview when the website was created. And it was created by Renzo Davoli, who's now a professor in Bologna. Back then, he was a uh, a student part-time working at the new department of informatic and there they decided to set up the website of the if, um, computer science department and then together with it they say well we can also create uh, take the domain unibo.it and just like have it and it will be handled by the computer science department because we know how to do things apparently and uh, but then yeah this email from July 1993 saying, well, there are other efforts from other departments doing their own thing, but we will get the unibo.it domain and it will be ours. Um, so, you'll, so through all these sources, you can see that you can reconstruct the role and the evolution of a website um, and you can get like a complete overview, conducting interviews, you get document and snapshot from different web archives, and you can use newspapers, which are a very useful source to understand the role of the website and how um, journalists were like looking at it and then describing it to the general public. And then in 2015, I did a collaboration with the Internet Archive, and we finally found out why the University of Bologna was excluded from the Wayback Machine. Apparently, they received in 2002 a request by the owner of the website, and as you have heard, it means something very highly placed at the University of Bologna who requested explicitly to remove the website from the Wayback Machine. I still haven't found out who this person was. We try to, we, we are not really sure. We try to investigate, but it, it was someone highly relevant creating the website back then. But luckily with a collaboration, now the website is again available on the Wayback Machine. And most interestingly, the Internet Archive actually preserved the website for the entirety of the past. They simply excluded it from the search tool, from the Wayback Machine. So as users, we didn't have access to it, but they archived it for the entirety. And so now it's possible to compare what I reconstructed from oral interviews and documents here and there and, and little pieces to how the website actually looked back then. So this is an overview of the tension with scarcity and now sources are fragile and how difficult it is to study something if it's not well preserved and people are putting efforts in collecting it. The other tension that emerges is when you're dealing with, with abundance, when you have too many sources and you just don't know how to deal with them. Um, for that, in my thesis, I focused on the digital collections that the university was making available on their website and they were preserved. And for example, the University of Bologna back then had like 5,000 doctoral theses. And general doctoral thesis give you an overview of you know, the different directions of research in, a, in an institute, because all departments and all researchers are writing doctoral thesis. So you can get like somehow an overview, which is at least more structured than the overview that you can get from scientific publications, because in different fields, people publish different things. Like you know, in computer science, you write very short papers, and in history, you write books. And so it's hard to compare those. Well, but in all departments, people write doctoral thesis. And this collection is part of a gigantic collection of um, doctoral theses from all around Europe. And back then it was 700,000 doctoral theses from like the majority of European universities, all of them participating while digitizing theses and putting them together. And the only ways that you can 
browse these sources are through a search tool where you just put a keyword and then you hope to get back something relevant or through a very structured organization in in disciplines you know and so given that back then i was really already highly interested in studying interdisciplinary research and understanding how um, interdisciplinary research brings additional collaboration between department or the tension of doing interdisciplinary research when you are sitting in a you know in a traditional department where everyone is focusing on a specific domain and you want to challenge this uh, this setting the question was how do we go beyond something that is a keyword search something where we just put some keywords and we get back a list of blue links and this basically became the area of research that I'm doing now. So most of the projects I'm involved now and the posts that I did uh, that I did are all related to what can we do that goes beyond keyword search. When you have a gigantic collection, how can you support researchers in finding and exploring it and identifying information, identifying underlying trends, for example, and things like that which of course brings attention in, in the humanities because it's this tension between quantitative analysis while we are trained as qualitative historians most of the time. So, but again, even if we are qualitative historians, we end up using keyboard searches and tools all the time. So it's important that we try to challenge and move a little bit beyond this, this initial starting point. So that's why I moved into the field of natural language processing, which is an area of computer science that deals with automatic analysis of, uh, of text. And in particular, I focused on a method called um, a topic models. I don't know uh, which point I am with the time and everything, five minutes. Okay, perfectly good. Uh, a method called topic models, which is a method for identifying automatically underlying topics in documents so you for example this is a famous example where you have a scientific publication and then you identify the tool automatically identifies that you have some words that are related to something that seems to be related to to genetics some things that are related to neuroscience some things that are related to uh, data science and computer science and then you can use this method and people have done it in the past to for example map different dissertations. These are dissertations from the University of Stanford, trying to understand how they overlap in topics. You, have, you can see that there are you know, overlaps within a mechanical engineer and civil engineer. And you can see that, for example, history and political science tend to be close together. And other people are using now more advanced method. One of them is called word embeddings. And this is a way of under... Uh, capturing semantic relations between words. These are like basic example where you have, for example, that the relation between king and queen automatically seems very similar to the relation between man and woman, or that the relations between verbs or relation between country and capital. You automatically, the tool identifies that the relation that you, you have between Spain and Madrid seem fairly similar to the one that you have between Italy and Rome. So there is something in the way that you use this term in text that seems to be similar. And uh, a student that I've been working with at UCL is now using this method for capturing uh, innovation and the relation between fields. And she's at the moment trying to visualize, for example, tension and overlap between different fields and try to identify collaboration. Along the same lines, in my PhD, I was focusing on capturing interdisciplinarity. And so I was using a method for, for example, identifying topics in PhD dissertation. Each dot here is a dissertation and back, and here in the back you have disciplines. For example, the first one is agriculture. And so you see that this topic seems to be relevant for dissertations in ag agriculture. All of them are moving up, while it's fairly stable in all other disciplines. So it seems to be a topic very relevant to the field of agriculture. Well, there is one in history down here that also reacted to that topic. And this is a dissertation about agricultural genomic and plant breeding in early 20th century Italy. So a thesis in history, we, in the Department of History with a supervisor as a historian, uh, Giuliano Pancaldi, but re highly related to a topic in agriculture. So this is a way of discovering interconnection between fields. 
And then again, another topic where you see it seems to be very relevant in agriculture, in, bio in biology, in chemistry, in medicine. And then you have a, a thesis popping up in computer science. And again, it's a thesis investigating it with computational method uh, mutations in the human proteome. So topic that is in between biology and medicine, but with computational method and done by a person sitting in the computer science department, collaborating with computer scientists. So through that and through a tool like this, then you can jump back and speak with the people involved in this to get a, you know, an overall perception of what were the challenges of doing interdisciplinary research in a system that is organized by um, discipline departments, for example. Um, but apart from the shiny tools, that the message that is important to take away as a historian is that, okay, it's the, the web is full of shiny tools that you can use. And you will see them, if you, if you remain in academia, you'll see them over and over that people are using cool tools all the time. The important thing as a historian is that we approach tools with a critical mindset. We need to be critical and understand how we can properly adopt them. What are the challenges? What are the problems? Given that we are not trained to use these tools and we come from a different background, how can we critically assess their reliability? How do we know that they do what they think we think they are doing? And now then, how can we use them to collect sources? And what are the problems of the way that we are collecting sources this way? Um, so just to wrap up quickly, uh, try to do it very quickly. Um, this goes uh, super, super quickly. Uh, so this goes into the direction of how to facilitate interdisciplinarity. And given that you are mostly students here, what are the things that you should care for your, you know, growing up as, as historians? And what are the things that you should ask when you're like speaking with, with departments and, and speaking with professors? And what are the things that are, that are essential? So one of them is training training in methodologies and experience in new methodologies, some funding opportunities. And especially if you go into a PhD, even if your supervisor has got some funding for doing interdisciplinary research, check if this person has experience doing interdisciplinary research. And it's not a cool new fund, like, you know, a new grant that they got out of nowhere. Just double check that this person is prepared because it's very challenging to do it. And then career opportunities. And so, we can have a long discussion later about career opportunities for historians in the new world, but it's, it's a relevant topic and it's important that we discuss it openly. So that's it. Um, I hope it was useful and then we can chat later. Thanks so much. It was for sure useful and extremely interesting. I have some questions later on. One in particular, um, but we will move on uh, to uh, uh, the relation by Lydia Boccanegra Barbeto, that is a, another historian um, that works at the University of Granada, Spain, and she is a uh, specialist in uh, digital humanities, digital culture, citizen science, and citizen humanities in general with the main focus on crowdsourcing projects uh, and migration studies. Uh, Professor Bocanegra is PI in three different research projects in the co-history uh, co -history project, the analysis of public participation in historical research from the perspective of citizen science, uh, crowdsourcing in history, new participatory and inclusive methodological challenges in historical research in Spain and Exiliad, uh, a project on a, a digital humanities project on the uh, Republican exiles after the Civil War in Spain. Uh, Lydia, I will uh, yes. move here and give you immediately the floor. Thank you. You should be able to share your screen. No, I am not able to share the, the screen. So it's yeah. disabled the... My, give me a second. Mm -hmm. I thought I already did it. All right. Let me check. No, yes. Okay. Perfect. Can you see the presentation? Yeah. 
Thank you very much. So thank you, Federico. Uh, first of, of, of all, I would like to thank Cisco and Mobilab, and especially Federico, <laughs> to invite me to participate in this seminar. And also thank you to Samir and Federico Nani that they, they did a very, very pretty interesting presentation. So the arguments are, are, are fine for me. And I think I will contact that because they are pretty, pretty interesting. So now uh, I would like to start with my, my presentation. It's, a, it's about public participation and also is focusing on strategies in history research project. And also I would like uh, to focus in the approaches and methods from citizen science and digital public history. As of course, this presentation is, uh, is included within the framework of two research projects, is called Historia and Crowdsourcing Historia. And both of them, I am the, the principal investigator. Uh, in, within the citizen science, now I will tell you about the difference, uh, the difference approach of this methodology. Uh, I would like to focus only in the participa uh, participatory approaches and also participatory activities, but the, this is the main focus of this uh, presentation for today. For regarding the citizen science, citizen science is a methodology, okay, and the, uh, it uses uh, uh, different public participation strategies, okay, according with the different, uh, let me check, uh, the different um, specialists, okay, outside also from the, the humanities and from outside from history, they define the, the public participation strategy in the history also in different um, uh, focus. In that one, this is a contributive uh, approach. Uh, basically, there are projects generally designed by scientists and where the public mailing contributes with data, okay? And there is a collaborative approach, usually designed by scientists and for which members of the public not only contribute with data, but also can help refine the project design, for example, analyzing the data or disseminating the results. There is another aspect, this is a co-creative, this is a very important word that probably mostly of you is, is listening all the time in, within the history discipline. Well, for, for citizen science, the co-creation projects are designed by scientists, but also for the member of the public, okay? Working together, at least some of the public participants are actively involved in most of all the stage of the scientific process. And this is the fourth um, approach. This is the hosted uh, approach. Uh, basically, there are projects in which the institutions provide part of the, its facilities or resources to present the programs developed and implemented by public groups or occasional visitors. Uh, of course, this is the main uh, approach uh, within the citizen science or citizen humanities. And we can, uh, let me show you the different um, strategies about them. This is the public engagement strategies. Of course, the public participation have also a specific model to participate. This is the engagement, okay? In, in, which, way, in, in which way the, 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 the public uh, engage with the topic itself, but this is not the main focus of this presentation. We are working now in the in the in the project within this to establish the uh, to study this model, but at the moment we will focus only in the public uh, <clears throat> strategies. Well, uh, let me know, let me talk about the co-historia in numbers, okay, the, the data. At the moment, we have uh, registered national international research projects in history, okay, uh, around 200 projects. Uh, um, uh, all the data has been collected within the, the co-historia web page. And there are is, uh, all the projects, uh, I know I'll show you the, the graph, no? It's a uh, very uh, multidisciplinary projects, okay? They have uh, defined around one, five, uh, 500 uh, disciplines. Uh, mostly of the projects have different approaches, uh, combined different approaches, no? And there are two, uh, around 200 participatory approaches. And also uh, they have registered different activities because one thing is the approaches and one thing is the activities that you are using to collect data, for example, using the public participation or stakeholders. In that case, let me show you the, the disciplines, practically all of the project listed is encompass more than one disciplines, add sub-disciplines, okay? And this is very important because demonstrates the high level of trans interdisciplinarity of this project that incorporate public participation in, in their implementation. So as you know, it's only, so it's uh, basically 
uh, according with the digital humanities, digital history, digital pub public history, also citizen science, those projects are always multidisciplinar, okay? Maybe you have in the base the history, but uh, after that you are talking and work, uh, uh, working within the research with other people from outside of the history discipline. So the digital humanities in that case are, uh, are in the lead and followed by cultural heritage, uh, history, museography, contemporary history, and archaeology. And the participatory approaches, the vast majority of the registered project use more than one participatory approach. In general, contributory and collaborative participation are the most commonly used. Uh, this is not strange because are more easy to involve people people in the specific aspect, easy aspects, no, and not involve them within the, for example, to, to, to think about the project idea, analyze the results, etc. Okay. So in the case of the collaborative approach, it represents almost the 50% of the total of the projects uh, classified. Let me show you uh, an example. For example, the virtual Matthew, uh, Martin Luther King project. This is the, an objective is to develop uh, the recreation historical movement in the US civil rights movement. Specifically, this project is focusing in an uh, immersive zone experience, okay, of the Matthew Luther King uh, uh, 1960 speech, uh, commonly known as fill up the jails, no? Which contributes to an expanded perspective of um, on rhetorical zones studies due to its structures, the types of arguments and the acceptability of those arguments and indicate by visitor comments. So the approach, the citizen approach of this project in, uh, in a specific project is hosted because exhibits that are housed in, for example, libraries and museums, even charts. For example, in 2014, this project uh, do a recreation at the New White Rock Baptist Charts in, with the basis of the, this, uh, specifically this charts is the basis of the project, okay? because Matthew Luther King uh, did this uh, speech within this uh, same uh, chart. And also the um, citizen assign approach for this uh, project is contributory, uh, while uh, this is a hosted project, viewers can provide the specific data regarding their experience no, as viewers and listeners of the Matthew uh, Luther King's speech. So uh, those, um, um, uh, those feedbacks from the visitors are evaluated uh, after the events by the uh, admin of the project uh, and et cetera. So let me show you the different activities, participating activities within the different um, approaches, okay? The main things are the data enrichment for the specific database, no? usually with database on data entry, according to metadata, uh, tagging, social tagging, classification, geolocalization, source collation, historical recreation, for example, transcription or text correction, and on also transfer knowledge. Uh, and all of them, all of the activities, uh, there is a prevalence of the web domain. Okay, this is very important. The participating activities, uh, the data enrichment and data entry and source collection are the predominant activities of the different uh, uh, project that uh, Coistoria has classified. No? The vast majority of the classified projects involve more than one main participatory activities with the use of these two activities together being very common. No? So the data enrichment and data entry and source collection. Data enrichment is the main activity, represents the 60% the 60, uh, 60 of the total of the classified projects. The main participant, and this is very important things to know, is the main participatory activities of the registered projects and initiative has been classified. So those activities that are the methodological focus of this participation and around of which the digital tool okay, is designed or implemented. For example, let me show you different examples and you can also better understand the different uh, um, uh, approaches, citizen design approaches, participation approaches, and also activities used. For example, the mapping outrage, the, uh, the impact of the Second World War on Japan cities. This uh, participatory use as activity, the geolocalization, uh, data entry and data enrichment uh, is uh, an used as a um, as a approach, a participatory approach is a contribution and contributory. So this story map shows Japanese cities affected by outrage during the Second World War. It was created as a part of the well, it's Iromi course of Japanese history in the University of Minnesota. It was created in 2018, and all data was collected by students using a survey uh, 123. 
So each student was assigned a city and entered information for the geographic point using external research and data set prepared by another professor. This is an example of a small scale participatory project. I met only two students and not open to the general public, but anyway, this is a participatory also project. Uh, it's website the, does not allow public participation, of course. It used a web mapping application as a tool, uh, RGIS, and all data were collected from the students through this uh, survey. And this survey is an application developed by ESRI and for conducting intelligent surveys and also allow multitude of data and information to be collected and then visualized uh, geographically. Another example, this is the Mapa Colaborativo de Regalios Histórico de Granada y Almería. This is uh, used as uh, main activities, the geolocalization and data entry and data enrichment, and use only one um, uh, participatory approach. It's a contributory. So the main objective of the, this collaborative map of historical irrigated lands is to make visible both these productive spaces, traditional irrigation, and irrigation communities that manage them. So a call for participation, the improvement of initial map is made. Uh, so this is an initiative creating collaboration with the European FP7 MOLA project and the Association for Historical and Traditional Irrigation Communities. It's funded by the also uh, the Spanish Foundation FECIR. So this MAPA Collaborativo is an example of a medium scale participatory project open to general public. This is, is, is of course, it's open for everybody, but this website use an online form to geolocalize, to, uh, geolocalize historical irrigation through an interactive map Okay, with an, uh, that is uh, done with OpenStreetMap. Another example, this is the Transcribe Bentham. Uh, this is a participatory initiative used as a main activity, uh, participatory activity transcription and is, all, is a contributory uh, as a focus. Transcribe Bentham is, um, uh, of course, participatory initiative funded by several institutions, including the European Commission. It has, uh, was launched in 2010. It is the, also it's formed part of the Bethan Project University of College London. The main objective of this project is to engage the public in the online transcription of original and studied manuscript articles written by this philosopher, not by Jeremy Bentham. Uh, at the moment, uh, volunteers have transcribed more than the 28,000 documents out of a total of uh, 47,000 documents that have already digitized within the, uh, this database. The, this is an example of a large scale participatory project open to the general public. It used uh, an OC, uh, not outsourced transcription desk uh, for the transcription of the documents and is linked to an internal web database. It used protection and quality systems, for example, such as limiting users to editing access, creating groups and editors via emails, etc. This is a very important, very important large scale uh, project. Another example, for example, the Holocaust Survivor Memoirs Program, it uses uh, the, the main activities, the data entry, data enrichment, and source collection, and also is a contributory um, uh, focus. The Holocaust Survivor Memoirs Program was established by the Asrieli Foundation in 2005 to collect, preserve, and share the memoirs on, and diaries no, written by the Holocaust survivors uh, who came to Canada. So it has published the stories of over 100 Canadian Holocaust survivors since the project launch. This is an example of a participatory project. And although geographically localized, this is Holocaust surviving Canada, is therefore a medium scale project despite being a very broad topic. In that case, will be the Holocaust. It has very well-structured data internally. Uh, although the participatory method relies on an email, just an email, there is not a, there is an internal registration form, etc. So you, you have, for example, uh, family memories about a uh, uh, Holocaust uh, survivor, you can send them by email, and that's it. And after that, they structure very well within the, the, the web page. This is the Memoria para Todos. This is um, also a participatory project. It uses the collection source, data enrichment, data entry, and data collection as the main activities of participatory activities. And this is a contributory. Basically, this project involves citizens in contributing histories that form part of the social history of Portugal. To do this, a participant can choose an important object, for example, in their life and, uh, or in the life of their relatives and tell their story. 
The aim is to promote the social dynamics of the construction of memory as an essential factor in, in defining one's own identity. This is done by the faculties of social and human science, Universitat de Lisboa. In that case, uh, this is an example of an open participatory project, although geographically localized, in that case is Portugal, and therefore it is a medium scale project uh, in thematic level. It uses an email as a mean of data collection, and thus it lacks an internal structure for automatic data collection on a web database. The subject matter is very broad and lacks a hierarchical um, structure in terms of content organization within the web page. It does not have a lot of collected or published uh, accessible data. It's an interesting project um, and the main topic, but it, is the, it doesn't have a lot of uh, data collected and well, uh, well organi organized within the web database. This one, Historic Graffiti, is a very important project. Uh, use a transcription, correction of text, enrichment data entry, and it is a collaborative project. Uh, the Historic Grave, this is an initiative, it is a community-centered public history project based in Ireland. Ireland. Uh, on the website, uh, using a digital crowdsourcing methodology, unregistered users describe the memorials and transcribe the epitaph, okay? Recording details of the people buried there. The website allows for an ad hoc transcription of data. In that case, the historic grave is an example of participatory project open to the public uh, at large, no, on a broad scale. It is a grassroots project centered on a physical participatory process with the communities and prior training, okay, as well as digital participatory process in the form of trans uh, the transcription of uh, epitaph. Uh, it, this project has the digitized more than 100,000 um, graves. And it has social innovation because people from other side of the Atlantic and the Pacific have uh, found their relative. It uses a transcription process with a system created at all, linked to, a, to an internal uh, web page. This is another example of the project. This is the Archivo Histórico del Partido Comunista, Colección Digital Complutense. Uh, it uses the main activity, activity, the participatory activity, social tagging. It is a contributive project, okay? The photography uh, collection of relating of the civil war in the historical archive of the Partido Com Comunista Español. It has approximately 3,000 photographs and more than 2,000 negatives. Well, in regards of to this collection of negatives, there is a set of almost 1,000 uh, images, of which around 100 has been digitized by the uh, uh, this digital collection. Okay, uh, the digitization project has been done by the Library of the Complutense University of uh, Madrid. Uh, this is an example of a medium scale participatory project open to the public. It's allowed participation at the level of, of tagging uh, photograph and providing opinions. No prior registration is required, and it have done at the test uh, of, for example, 80 paragraphs of the text in, within this, and it's absent. So this is a very uh, also important project within the historical uh, archive in Spain. The last one, this is the Choice Cultural Heritage Opportunity for Improving Civic Engagement. Uh, in this project, it has uh, the main uh, activities, participatory activities, the transcription, correction of text, and data entry and data enrichment, and this is a collaborative uh, project. This uh, initiative develop, uh, has been developed and implemented in the four Eastern Partnership countries, Armenia, Belarus, Moldova, and Ukraine. It has been founded by the European Commission, and its main objective is to strengthen the capacities of, and development of non-governmental, non-profit organizations and initiatives engaged in the conservation, rethinking, and promotion of cultural and historical uh, heritage in their local communities, countries, as well as the Eastern European region. Okay, this is an example of participatory project at a medium, uh, medium and large scale and localized, in that case, in the Eastern of European countries. It used participatory process in the different activities it's carry out where they work with a specific audience, for example, public activities, young people, etc. Uh, this is a project very much based on a knowledge transfer in a bidirectional way, acquisition of new knowledge by those stakeholders, skills, and experience on practical participation in project actions and events. So with this lens, uh, with this one, uh, I will finish my presentation. And I think this is uh, an important uh, thing to know that the public participation is, is, is something that all and almost all the uh, 
digital history history uh, project is using at the moment. Uh, this is the main the main activity, the main aspect that uh, characterizes not only the digital history but also the digital humanities and also the digital uh, public history. So here is my presentation. So thank you, thank you, Lydia, for no this. Uh, not only, yeah. Thank you not only for this uh, very interesting and dense presentation, but also for th the work you're, you have been doing that is an important work in order to make this project known more than uh, they are tonight. And my question will probably be later on about this, how much this, um, this uh, project are known within the academic community. Anyway, I would take 10 minutes, uh, like a short break, so that uh, uh, we can uh, have a coffee, like a very fast one. And afterwards at 12.10, we will have about uh, 50 minutes uh, in order to answer question uh, and to discuss. Is that all right for you? Good, so let's take 10 minutes. See you in uh, at 12.10. Okay.
So we are back, almost all of us. 
uh, Samir is still missing. So, but we don't have much time. So, um, I would start with uh, uh, questions from the floor. Let's see if Samir is arriving. Yeah, just a few seconds. Should we sit over there? Yeah, please. So are there any questions from the students, from uh, colleagues here? Yeah. I will translate it. E rischia di entrare in contrasto con la nuova idea di web 3.0 decentralizzata, federata, cioè federata con un focus molto più ampio sulla privacy e l'anonimità degli utenti. So I'll translate for people at home and for English speaking only. Um, does the project of archiving the web uh, enters into a conflict with uh, the needs of uh, uh, Web 3.0 and the needs for privacy, uh, that is, uh, uh, of course, a, one of the priorities in the government, should be one of the priorities in the governments of the web. You, you go ahead. Um, just um, uh, a very, a very general answer to, to this question, in, in, in my opinion, uh, um, it, it is not possible to, um, uh, to, to archive and to uh, capture everything uh, for, for the web content. So this is, uh, I mean, in the, in the past we, we tried, for example, with the Biblioteca Universalis, so we tried to have, to, uh, to have a, a, a general umbrella where we, we can uh, comprise everything about, uh, um, uh, about the human knowledge uh, for, um, um, for for the libraries, for example, in the Bibliotheca Universalis, but it, it was a, a failure. Uh, it, it, it did not succeed. As, as I said before, the, the, uh, the appraisal, the, the selection process is fundamental, especially in, in, the, uh, in um, approaching a web archiving, a web archiving project. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, uh, I think that in, in, in this specific case, the, uh, the, the, the the privacy needs uh, obviously uh, goes in, in conflict with the um, uh, with the with the um, uh, web archiving scope itself. Uh, for 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 example, for the crawler itself, to for, to uh, to crawl the, the pages, uh, these must be um, publicly publicly available, and this must be uh, directly accessible through the URL to be uh, captured and to be. Um, archived uh, in, uh, into the, um, uh, the web archiving project. So um, yeah, again, uh, the, uh, I think we, we, we need to focus on, on, the, uh, on the web contents worthy uh, for, uh, the, you know, for the research and for the uh, other purposes in, uh, of the uh, people serving in the future. So you do not, you do not see the Internet Archive web Wayback Machine as a viable uh, archiving project. No, I mean as long as as they can, it is. But uh, in, um, as uh, for example, as Federico um, showed before, uh, we uh, not always that 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 is possible because, um, for example, an email is not responsible. The the, the, um, the owner uh, does not allow the the capture of the of the web page. Uh, the um, uh, the internet pages, as I said 
I uh, said before, they cannot be captured. Uh, and um, uh, most of the time, for example, the most interesting archives, the digital collection, are kept uh, into the internet pages, because, uh, uh, for example, in texture or other media are uh, captured, uh, are kept uh, there. So, uh, yeah, um, I, I mean, it, it, probably it, it is not feasible. Uh, um, and uh, in this sense, as always, uh, I, I, I just see, see the, the, the digital, the, the web pages like a digital collection, like a, uh, any other digital collection. For, for a digital collection, of, uh, first of all, uh, this must be appraised, uh, disposed of if, if, if needed, and then can be preserved for a long term uh, uh, period. Um, uh, so only the, through these uh, three steps, uh, we, we can guarantee a, um, a, a, a worthy bunch of, of, of the digital heritage uh, for, for uh, uh, the future preservation. That's just my opinion. And yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's a tricky question. Yeah, yeah, it goes into conflict. I, like, I don't know, like, even if you think about social media, like that, that, that's the first thing. Like when you, you post something on Twitter, you are not expecting this thing to be. It's already like tricky to understand exactly what Twitter will do with that tweet, but you are not thinking or expecting that an external entity will actually interact with it and maybe preserve it and put it into a special collection or, or things like that. And I mean, it's challenging with social media also because um, lots of researchers and a lot of external companies are also dealing and using these materials for like third party purposes. Like for instance, like now there's Eurovision and well, it's a good idea to collect tweets about Eurovision and to preserve them, to get like a nice overview of what people were discussing about it. And these efforts, it depends who's conducting them. If it's, if it's a, a, an institution for the preservation and, you know, um, of specific collection representing specific events, it's already a tricky angle, but what if it's instead is like an effort of a you know, third party person that wants to collect it, or if it's someone that wants to collect some tweets just to recreate then a tool that automatically tweets think about their vision itself. So uh, yes, there's, there's definitely this tension there. Um, and uh, it will be an interesting question to ask to archivists or uh, historians whether this tension was already discussed in the past. Like, I don't know how we were dealing when we were archiving personal diaries without reaching out to the family of the owner of this diary or like letters sent during the Second World War, whether the discussion was already in place, even if the sources were analog. Um, I, well, having worked on diaries and letters for my yeah. PhD, they usually, uh, well, first of all, the, the, the length of the reconstruction of history is becoming shorter and shorter. Mm. And so uh, it, it is a, a new thing because as soon as uh, historians are starting to study 10 years ago instead of 20 or 30, and, and the more uh, you are near to the present, the more pressing these problems are. So they are new problems. But usually diaries and letters are given, are given. To, to, the, to the archives from families or for, for the writer themselves. So there is an implicit uh, permission for, for use of it. Even a legal obligation for, yeah. uh, for historical purposes, yeah. yeah. So uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, I have a question for uh, the because uh, I really appreciated the uh, last part of this uh, uh, his presentation and in particular the first point when he said that the third the, one of the most important things for today historians is to train in new methodologies. Now um, to me I've always found difficult to find uh, in uh, an academic program or even in the internet a way to learn these new methodologies. For example, uh, a project I found on the internet that I found really interesting is the in the website, uh, the program in Soria. It is uh, probably the most complete and uh, uh, well done project to train historians in the use, for example, Python, data visualization, management, and so on and so forth. 
But so, what are your suggestions for a student like like us, for students like us that may, might be interested in these kinds of topics to study, to focus on, in order to enter and be parts of project like the one, for example, the Bokanet represented us and even you showed us. So. That's my question. So let me let me just say something for the chat at home because maybe it was not uh, completely understandable. Um, uh, the question is about uh, are there any tools or ways in uh, which students can interact and start to work on uh, digital history, digital tools, such as the ones, for example, that uh, Federico Nanni um, presented to us. Okay, so. Okay, let's start the discussion with something a bit provocative and then let's see uh, how that goes. Um, I don't know about your experience studying history, uh, but my experience studying history that like back in Bologna 10 years ago was that most of the courses that were, I was following were about topics, like I don't know, history in the United States, history, like contemporary history. And just like a little bit of those were about methodology. So that I reached the beginning of my PhD, realized that I had no idea how to do history. Like, you know, you just go to an art and like, what do you do? Like, you know, like this feeling of, I don't know my traditional method. I don't know what I should be doing. Yeah. And so my, my partner, she, she does bi, um, biophysics and she has a training in physics. There's lots of focus on uh, the methodology and the scientific method and this type of approach. And I am, I'm really proud that in the humanities and history in particular, there are discussion about this tension between uh, a humanities way of doing things that is different from a scientific rigor of the scientific method. But then I'm not really sure if we actually define it when we are training students, like we are clarifying what do we mean when we say uh, the historical method. But that's like initial provocative thing. Maybe I'm, I'm maybe people disagree and that's fine. Second thing about new methodologies. Yes, okay. Um, it's tricky. Like, I don't know, most of the time, uh, so I learned new methodologies because I was going to some computer science courses at the University of Bologna. Because when I started a PhD, I had like some, um, some credits that I had to get and uh, we should follow some courses here and there. And I picked some, like, you know, some seminars at the computer science department. They weren't tailored for me at all. They were like, you know, seminars for computer science students at the end of their master's degree. So it was a mess, but, uh, but that was a starting point. And then when I was in Germany, I was offering lots of training, but then in that case, I was basically a PhD student and then a postdoc there for a few years doing some training here and there for students. And then I, you know, I moved to, to London and no one picked it up. So it's like, there are like these random things here and there. I think, yeah, I mean, the programming historian is definitely the, the best starting point, but I think it's essential that you pair it up with a specific little project that you want to do. Uh, if you, it could be a small seminar project, or it could be a piece of your master thesis in which you build some visualization, you get some data and you build some visualization. Uh, but you need something hands on that you do from start to finish, even without a supervision, because like most of the time, even my supervisor in Bologna, he had like no experience of computational methods, but you, it, it's hard to move independently at the beginning, but it's important that you try to challenge yourself around these things and reach out to people like drop me an email if you need some feedbacks. And no problem at all, or get in touch with people that have written like some of these tutorials just like reach out to them explaining what's your problem and most of the time it's just a matter of language and understanding It's like you just most of the time you just need to find the clear words to explain what you are trying to do and then most of the things are either like you know there's an xkcd comic on this on either they are like easily doable or they are incredibly impossible so it's like you know that these little bothers but i think that that's a good starting point we have a question from the chat uh, Dai, uh, oh. Dai Wu. Hi. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so actually, I have a question regarding the quality quality control for web archiving service. 
So mm -hmm. I wonder if is there any other software to do the quality control or it is done manually by a quality control team and also the, the owners? Yeah, that's my question. Uh, well, um, as, as regards to the, 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 the big city and the virus check uh, on, on the web contents captured, yes, of course, there, there are some uh, automatic tool, uh, some pieces of software that uh, um, um, allows uh, to, um, uh, to make the the quality control in this sense. Uh, there are tools for the uh, automatic indexing uh, of, the, um, of the web pages uh, and uh, for the uh, re uh, metadata enrichment of the web pages uh, themselves. But what is it is missing and what it is totally manual is the um, uh, the quality control uh, concerning the uh, the content itself on the on the web pages. In this sense, as, as I said, the the web uh, website owners are uh, responsible for. Uh, uh, for checking manually uh, the, the the web pages uh, get captured and uh, um, um, checking if uh, uh, whether uh, some some links uh, does not work if uh, some contents are not uh, downloaded um, uh, properly um, etc. Uh, so in, in, uh, unfortunately, the the quality control actually is. Uh, um, uh, is still manual, and uh, it is up to the website owners uh, um, in in this sense. So for for this reason, uh, as I said, as, a, as a, an added value, uh, the uh, uh, the web collection in in, the, in this case are um, are pretty well are pretty well built um, uh, because there is a, a, a quality control a manual control quality control by uh, the website owner. Um, thank you. Thank uh, you. May, may, may I ask another question, but regarding to uh, participatory approaches? Sure. Okay. Um, so, uh, except for the project name mapping eight grades, um, the participants are students. And how about the other? projects like how can uh, we approach the people and is there any kind of pool of people that uh, we can promote or feature our uh, projects to engage with the people and uh, and during the time that uh, carrying out the projects uh, I wonder if is there any obstacle like conveying the meaning of the projects to the people who are the partic participants that's my questions. Okay, so uh, it's for me, no? <laughs> I understand the, the question. In that case, uh, to engage people, you can start with the, with the topic itself, okay? If the main topic that you are studying uh, at the moment. So if your topic is interesting, you will have a lot of people that would like to, to, to participate. And also you need to, uh, to start with the, the engagement using different, uh, for example, um, sections within your institution, for example, media labs, etc., and learning with the different methodology to uh, include people or uh, stakeholders within the research. For example, the media lab, they are uh, usually working with the living labs, okay, laboratorios de ciudadanos or uh, social labs, and they are uh, usually uh, working with uh, stakeholders, public bodies, etc., with a, a specific topic, not only in humanities, also in history, also social science, etc. So first of all, this is the topic. And the second one, uh, also the, the different institution, in that case, the media lab. And the third one is the social media. The social media are always the main channel, the main specific channel that you can involve people. So you need to look for identify the specific uh, social media profiles regarding your topic and it launch the, the topic, uh, your, your project, etc., with them. And you will have a lot of people that can contribute with a specific and a small contribution, okay, but a small by a small, a small, a small, and plus a small, you will have a mountain of the uh, uh, contributions uh, regarding your, your project. Of course, before, uh, before to do that, you need to have be pretty clear the methodology that, that you want to, to, to use. For example, do you like, uh, for example, people working your project 
when I say people can be stakeholders, ONGs, uh, public institutions, not only, not only uh, public at large, okay? Uh, for example, you say, I would like the only uh, to use, I, I only need data collection, for example. When I have, for example, already a very important project with a thousand of data, I will put online everything on, on the web and I only need the public participation to transcribe them, for example, okay? So in that case, this is important to establish before, which kind of participation do you want to, to establish? And after that, looking for the people about that. But the first thing is the topic, which topic do you like to, to analyze? And after that, thinking about the, the results, because uh, usually the history, the um, history research project have a social innovation. So their outputs have applicability on the social. For example, uh, I know a lot of projects that uh, thanks to them, for example, Republican Exile, um, civil wars, etc. the people have found uh, uh, disappeared uh, persons, okay, relative disappears through the project. So maybe from the beginning, the administration, the, the IP of the project didn't think, didn't thought about the, those projects ha has uh, practicability in the end, but at the end, this uh, history project with the mainly contribution of the people, the results can be, uh, be very practice for other people. So those two projects are have innovation, social innovation at the end. So, and this is very uh, important also for, for example, the European Commission, the two uh, funding projects with uh, social practicability. I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um, I, I just was want to, uh, my, my, my question was about uh, methodology after we, we talked about, I'm not an historian, I'm a cultural anthropologist. I can see in the in work of, of Connect, the, the project, the participatory project exposed by Bocanegra and now she answered, she, she explained. I'm um, sorry, Lydia, can you hear correctly? A bit. Not mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Uh, I would like to, um, please, if you can also uh, clarify, focus better on difference of method. I, um, I, feel, I see between your, uh, your engagement with that uh, kind of work with digital, uh, digital history, because um, the work of uh, Bocanegra, uh, I am a cultural anthropologist, I think, and anthro it is uh, a kind of interchangeable figure. The, the work you show, the, the kind of projects you, uh, you show, um, I can also say there is a project of anthropology for, for an anthropologist. There is not specifically, specifically linked with uh, historian or maybe mm. that that's maybe it's a, a question about our uh, disciplinary boundaries that is very <laughs> um, blurred. very blurred okay but I think that it is um, useful to spend some to, to say some um, or, or something more about difference of method I uh, in your way, they, they, there are three three different aspects of uh, this kind of work. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I mean, it, it, it's a very good point, and it's this like strange tension when you are like approaching like a new type of material, a new type of source or a new methodologies. And then you have these like, you know, traditional tensions between disciplines. Uh, like as an example, like the web as a source, like using web archives uh, in the international community, or at least in the environment that I've been in the international community, started in, in media studies kind of field. And, and it was very strange because people were using the web to study the web of the past, like as a 
as a media source instead of using it as a source for studying our past as people. And, and so when I went to, to Denmark to, to, to do a visiting, I was in a media studies department with people studying medias and like thinking about the role of, of, of the web as a way of communicating, but not as a historical source. And I was the only historian there trying to like, you know, uh, try to put it into that perspective. And then you have a strange tension similar when you speak about computational methods, especially text analysis method in the humanities, because there has been lots of focus around literary studies, where part of the community has a very strong quantitative approach, like you know, all the things about st uh, stylometry and uh, recognizing similarity between author, like um, authorship attribution, all these studies of automatically identifying who was the author of a book. And even the book by Franco Moretti on distant reading mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. all focused around the use of these methods <clears throat> in literary studies and in critical literature and things like that. And for me as a historian, it was very hard to approach those texts because it was like, okay, I'm interested in the method, but I don't see any connection between what I want to do in history. And uh, the angle in history is mostly on information retrieval because it's the challenge that as historians we have. You go to an archive and you don't know how to find things. So it's, and it's a similar thing now with big data, you go, you have a gigantic amount of things and you don't know how to face this, uh, this amount of information. But um, it, it's strange because it's like, it's a little bit of a tension between traditional way of then pitching it back to your own community, what you're doing. And also the fact that maybe like, venues where people meet together to, to describe what they are doing are either focused in their own discipline or are they only focused on methods and the discipline it's out there. Like uh, if you go to the Digital Humanities Conference, it's all about methods, but then you don't understand how this method then fit back to your, you know, to history and to, to geography and things like that. So it's a bit of a long underlying tension. I have a question also. Uh, thank you, Federico, because I'm pretty agree with you. In, in that case, for example, when you start a, a history project using the web, for example, from is born from the digital itself, okay, there is no there is no boundaries. So it's multidisciplinary by, by itself. For example, I have a project, my first project combines uh, the methodology from uh, natural science, citizen science, combine e-commerce uh, uh, methodology from the private sector. For example, I use the e-commerce web page design to use the same content and how to distribute the different contents in the web in order to take people okay, in my project and they spend time on there and give me data. I also use the quantitative approach using, the, for example, large scale amount of data, analyzing them, et cetera, from social media, et cetera. I'm using social distance, the middle distance reading and social distance readings from Moretti, okay, of course, from a large amount of data. And also from ICT methodology. For example, at the very beginning of my project, when I'm setting up my project, I mean, um, I'm using uh, to, to analyze which open source I will use in order to uh, establish not only the methodology inside, but also to do the analysis uh, after that. So I combine the different methodology. In that case, I say, oh my God, this, this is not anymore in historia. So it's, it's, there is no document, there is not it's everything there. And my project is, um, is providing new source Okay, born directly in the digital from, for example, the uh, social media that is connected, that I created myself and it is connected my project. Okay, this is a thematic project, not this co-story, this exiliadas, for example. And, for, and there is a lot, of, uh, a lot of data and a lot of methodology combined itself in the one aspect. So my project, Exiliada, is not all history, it's all anthropology, it's sociology. Because I am analyzing not only the, for example, the Republican exile in the 1936 in the Spanish Civil War, but I'm also analyzing the digital culture of a Republican exile on the web mm -hmm. through the social media, through the followers, analyzing using, for example, Gephi, et cetera, analyzing with graph, okay, uh, that information. And the very beginning, almost well, maybe uh, seven years old, no, for example, no publication, no journal the, uh, in history, specific in history, they say, no, no, this is not this history. I say, no, exactly. this is history. It's not history, no, no, this is history. 
But they don't know at the moment, all, all of those uh, journals, historian journals, starts to publish this, the, the, this kind of uh, topics. Okay, they, are, they become more multidisciplinary because this is the current path and they are working in the same path at the moment. Mostly of, um, uh, mo sorry, mo mostly of us, we don't have boundaries. We are multidisciplinary. If you start to working on the web, if you start to working on the e-project and the, et cetera, you are using and uh, adding a lot of uh, methodologies from different disciplines. So you are a multidisciplinary. This is my opinion. I think it's it's uh, the I feeling agree. we all have in this room. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, so if, I, if I may just, just add uh, one, one, one thing, I'm, I'm, I'm not a I'm historian, so I'm, I, I'll, um, I'll uh, leave you the um, uh, specialized talk about the, the um, uh, history research uh, method methodology, uh, probably with the, um, uh, but just um, coming back with the EOP project that I talked about, uh, um, the, um, probably because it, it was uh, a, a relatively young uh, project, it may started um, uh, more or less seven years ago, we were going to capture the, uh, uh, the EU domain uh, for the produced by the European institutions, but uh, as an archivist and, and as an, an information specialist, uh, what we we focused on was about the access of the of the digital contents of this uh, material. Um, in, in this sense, the European Commission has uh, uh, made a great uh, uh, work about the um, uh, the um, uh, authority files um, uh, built for the uh, European for all the European institutions uh, um, domain, uh, which mean a very large domain because, of, as you can imagine, um, uh, uh, the, the authority files can touch a, a topic uh, from agriculture to industry to uh, any other history, etc. Et, 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 et and uh, uh, the idea uh, is to create ontologies uh, uh, where uh, web not only web contents about all web I, I, I would say the, the digital sources uh, can be comprised and can be um, um, uh, browse through uh, the, this uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, network as uh, my colleagues uh, said uh, before so. So we still have 10 minutes and I will take them for myself just to give you, uh, just to ask you very fast questions, uh, one for each one of you, the, the things that uh, came into my mind. And they are uh, like technical, not uh, particularly methodological or complex so that we can be answered in this 10 minutes. I will start with Samir asking him why uh, the European Union uh, decided to use uh, archive it as a service to and not to create their own, since the multiplication of, of uh, archives is uh, in itself a, a sort of guarantee of uh, longevity. Mm -hmm. But archive it is uh, the, the, the payment, the, the, if I'm correct, is the, the, the service offered by the same uh, Wayback Machine and the Internet Archive. Uh, uh, and it's a, a US uh, uh, based uh, company. So I, I found it like in a way surprising. I will, I will go on like with the question and then we, we can go on. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, for Lydia, Lydia, uh, I find your project, the project you presented, the, 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 this uh, index, let's say, of project extremely interesting and useful not only for, uh, let's say, research, but also for teaching. And I will use it for sure in my next. Uh, uh, course. Uh, my question is, have you ever considered to uh, take a look at how these different projects are cited or used in, uh, let's say, traditional historical literature? Uh, it, what is the dialogue uh, between these projects that are all, uh, the citizen science project and the let's say the historical literature, the relevant historical literature for each and every one project. Because one of my, uh, let's say, fear is that all this project that involves, uh, or even big projects like Europeana 1914, mm -hmm. 1918, 
uh, that involve uh, uh, citizen participation uh, are like in their own sort of bubble, let's say, and they are not in, in a strong dialogue because maybe they are not known by, by, by professional historians. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, it would be interesting also to know what kind of, uh, what degree of penetration they can get to have into the relevant historical field in a professional academic uh, environment. And for Federico in, instead, my question is, why don't we have a book on, uh, on, your, uh, on the research you presented? Mm -hmm. or or a, a website that they have structured like a book no um, really because i would be glad to to have these and other kind of uh work like this to give to students to make them and also as starting starting to uh make colleagues even more than students understand uh, the potential and well actually the need for uh, engaging with these topics we have talked today. So these are my three of questions. Uh, okay, if I, when I understood that you, um, you asked about the, when we multiply our efforts for web archiving the EU contents, uh, the EU institutions contents, uh, if uh, we have already internet archives, uh, the web- no, 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 no. Uh, you use I saw that uh, when you uh, when you gave us the link, it was archive it. Yeah. Right. Archive it is a, a European a, a internet archive uh, yes. uh, service. What I was wondering is why the European Union uh, didn't decide to create their own uh, yeah. repository. Uh, that, that, that was uh, yeah uh, originally and um, above all it was a, a cost related uh, uh, need to uh, optimize uh, the financial and the human resources efforts and uh, um, generally for uh, institutions it's uh, uh, it's uh, always um, um, more, more convenient to outsource uh, some, some services like the uh, like this. What uh, um, as as a guarantee for for the European um, uh, for the European Union and for the digital archives uh, produced by the uh, European institution, uh, there was the um, uh, two uh, um, requirements, uh, two technical requirements for the uh, for the Internet archives, and, the, and, and that, that was the. Um, uh, the need to uh, to dump uh, all the digital contents uh, uh, whenever needed, uh, and uh, uh, the the need to um, to preserve the, the, this material locally on a storage uh, on a storage uh, on site uh, storage uh, locally. Uh, this was uh, um, uh, connected to the need to for to preserve uh, uh, this material in a in effective way, uh, and uh, uh, in order to allow the um, OP the uh, publication office to um, uh, uh, to trigger uh, their own uh, digital preservation program. Uh, so in in in, the, in in this manner, we we can have uh, a. A more agile tool offered by uh, and the outsourced uh, company, uh, but on the other side, we we have our our own collection uh, kept uh, into the uh, digital vaults of the um, um, uh, application office. Uh, so it was uh, just uh, yeah, they, 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 we found it as a more convenient way for for us. Yeah, Cisco is doing, actually doing the same. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> but yeah, I thought that. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, Lydia. Okay, so thank you for your, your question because it's very, very interesting. So uh, how the, those projects are relevant in the academia? For example, at the research level, it's well established in my opinion. Video. I'm conducting a bibliometric, uh, bibliometric uh, research in, in this point, and I can tell you that uh, in this sphere is well established. Why? Because, for example, the European Commission, with the H2020 program and also the Horizon program, uh, established the citizen design as a main discipline, okay, for this kind of uh, funded project. And also, 
within the current program, the, the Horizon Europe program, is uh, this citizen science aspect is within the open science and can be something mandatory in the all the uh, projects. Okay, maybe you can use this participatory approach and etc. So at the level of research, there is a lot of projects, a lot of publications about that. Okay, not only the the, the methodology itself, but also, for example, a topic that use the participatory approach and this is well established however at the level of for example teaching is not well established in my opinion so uh, in my i don't have data for that but uh, this is my my sensation that in the in the classroom the people uh, the teachers are still using the 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 papers the, the books the chapters for example myself i never use that uh, from uh, i never use that uh, sources I'm using projects. I'm using uh, open data uh, in regarding with well, the different projects because there is a lot of projects about that. So for example, I said to my, my students in contemporary history lessons, you can uh, do a practice uh, participating to transcribing this kind of document in this, uh, in this project about Holocaust. Oh, thank you. And more, there is a lot of more engagement, more understanding about the topic, participating in a research topic. Contributing mm -hmm. some maybe transcription, collecting data. Oh, I have my my grandfather that was fighting in the in the in the Partigiani, for example, and I have a lot of documents. Go ahead and mm, uh, digitize the, those documents and upload in this on those projects. I never use. I'm not using anymore the 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 papers and the and the books because of course they are there. It's, it's the is the is traditional. But why not using original data from uh, projects that are academically recognized, okay, at the institutional level and also, or not uh, maybe academia level, but also from ONGs or public bodies? Why not? They should mm -hmm. start to work on this kind of uh, methodology and practice. And this is more important. In my opinion, from the sphere of the history, for example, is not well established at the moment. Despite they are, for example, they are, uh, start to uh, adding in the research, for example, from, from uh, those teachers, the citizen science methodology, the participatory approach, but they don't know they are using the citizen science methodology. And by mistake, they are using the word co-created. It's not co-created, it's only contribution, for example, no? This is the reason of my, the, the main, main uh, sorry, the main objective of my, of my projects. But uh, we should start now uh, to, um, uh, to pass this kind of methodological participatory approach within the teaching, within the academia, not only for the research, but on the, on the teaching aspect, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Um, yeah, um, it's very much in line with what Lydia said. Me right? too. I, I mean, it's uh, so pragmatically, I never <clears throat> wrote a book because I, well, never had the time, like, uh, and, and no one that was paying for my position in the different institutes where I was, was actually paying me for writing a book. Most of the time it was like, I don't know, computer science department and you have to you know, write a paper after another paper, another paper, and it was not that. But honestly, the main thing was that I never used many books for learning things. I, I was using the programming historian at the beginning, mm. a lot. And so what I thought, which is highly connected to web archiving stuff, so I thought about teaching stuff, and then I created a course that I was teaching for many years in Germany to, to master students and PhD students. And then, like before pandemic times, I decided to record all the lessons. So we had like videos of those, and made a GitHub um, repository with all the code. And then I left Man9 and I stopped paying for the website that was hosting it because I was like, yeah, okay, well, I'm not there anymore. Luckily, I archived it, so it's in the internet archive, and I can give you the link, or the link is somewhere Please. on the web. So there, is, there are materials of all the courses that I was teaching there. And now that I, in, my, in the institute where I am, uh, we are organizing eternal courses. And uh, so we are coordinating new things. But then there's always the point of why not consolidating everything in a digital book or in something that people could use. But those things, they take a lot of time. And, and it's very hard to do, you know, having a proper work-life balance and okay. doing things that are useful for your career and contribute to the community. So yeah, so I started with teaching, but then yes, of course, maybe, maybe, oh, maybe in the yeah. future I'll write a book. Yeah. If, if I may add something, 
don't put pressure on him. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 of course. I, I, read, I read that an awful story is, is by who read an, uh, an article on uh, American anthropologist written mm. by uh, Orin Starn, uh, it is anthropologist of writers. It is a mm, frightful story of uh, the, the, the need, the pressure on writing the book. No, no, no. Yeah. That was not my intention. <laughs> no, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> so it, is, it is terrible, but it's very interesting in, in some literal context of the, of the rate of conversation. But because uh, uh, what you said, it is to uh, also what, what you are saying is to come back to a kind of uh, oral teaching. Absolutely. Uh, and with uh, so um, to to uh, to put values on something that uh, the book, the writing book, is kind of. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how but this raises problems, actual problems, because. The, the discipline in itself didn't change so much. No. So wh whereas whereas there are these new forms of uh, going back to yeah. oral or whatever, yeah. still the, the discipline doesn't change so much. So if we want to, uh, in a way, uh, make it so that more colleagues work on this kind of topic they keep in yeah. mind and having funding and having yeah. people working mm -hmm. on it, that means that we have to find a way to dialogue in some way with people that are not specialists on this and do not have these kind of things, both for participatory uh, and citizen science and for web archiving. The fact that with such an interest topic, you don't have the career incentive of writing a book is, is in itself uh, significant and, and a problem in a way. Absolutely. So uh, on this note, <laughs> that I hope we will become like it, it, it is a problem, but I hope we, have, we will in time find a solution. Uh, I thank you all so much, and I really hope, I really, really sincerely hope that we will have uh, and believe that we will have more and more occasions to work with each other, to hear each other, and to go on with this conversation. Thank you for all that came here, here Thank or you. in uh, in online. See you, see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye you. bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>